with you this morning about a topic. I, I know you've heard it, but it's sometimes it's good to just let it sink in again and let it kind of renew and refresh our hearts because, you know, life can be hard and life can be confusing and, you know, it's just not always easy. And I was in high school, well, college. I remember going to a worship, worship uh, evening, a talk, and the person who spoke asked one simple question, that what keeps you going? What keeps you going in life? What do you live for? What's the purpose of life? Where's your confidence? And, you know, of course we know that God is our strength, and we need that strength that God gives us every day but we also need the bigger picture. Where is this world going? Where is it heading? And we need to know that there's a great final consummation of the great hope. There is something big is about to happen, and Jesus is coming again. Our scripture reading is, Let not your hearts be troubled. They can be troubled. Our hearts, daily, there's trouble. You face your troubles, life has its troubles, the news shares lots of troubles, and it can be troubling to live in this planet. You believe in God, you have faith in God, Jesus says, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. The word mansions means rooms, many, lots of space, rooms that you can dwell in. He says, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus says, I'm going to make it gorgeous, beautiful. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, he left these words, I will what? I will come again. That's just the blessed hope. He says he's going to come again. He doesn't lie. And we can count on that simple promise. He's coming again. Where's this world heading? What's the great hope? Jesus is coming again. He's coming. He's coming. And sometimes we just need to have that sustaining encouragement that there's more to life than what happens on this planet. There's hope. He's coming again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you may, you know, and the way you know. And then over in John 17, he says, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. This was the great prayer of Jesus. He said, I want my believers, my people to be with me. He says, uh, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. God said, I want my children to see the glory that wonderful glory that we have in heaven and God wants us to be with him up in paradise there is no other teaching so clearly taught in the Bible as the second coming it's the most and greatest teaching in the Bible that Jesus is coming again 1,500 times mentioned in Scripture. Now, I haven't counted all those. I've just been told there's 1,500 verses. I wish I could share them all with you. But there's 300 times it's mentioned in the New Testament. And it's about one out of 15 verses in the New Testament say something, have something to do with the second coming. That was the great hope of God's people. What's it going to be like? What's it going to be like? That breathtaking, glorious, wonderful event when the sky gets filled with angels and they're shouting and the healing from those that have been sick and everything we've all longed for will finally be here. What a hope. And of course, artists try to paint this picture and they just... They just give a feeble picture of what it might look like. I think the whole sky, everywhere you're going to look, is going to be filled with angels, angels, angels. 
It's going to be a beautiful moment, a beautiful day, full of beauty, glory, glory and happiness. Titus, well, Paul writes to Titus, he says, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking forward. We have a hope. There's something good going to happen. And uh, it's a blessed hope. That's how Uriah Smith, one of our early church pioneers, would sign his letters all the time. He just said, in the blessed hope, Uriah Smith. In the book Great Controversy, it says, one of the most solemn and yet most glorious truths re revealed in the Bible is that of Christ's second coming to complete the great work of redemption. To God's pilgrim people, so long left to sojourn in the region and shadow of death, a precious joy, inspiring hope is given in the promise of His appearing to bring home again His banished. The doctrine of the second advent is the very keynote of the sacred scriptures. From the day where the first pair turned their sorrowing steps from Eden, the children of faith have waited the coming of the promised one to break the destroyer's power and bring them again to the lost paradise. This second coming, this future hope, everything is just temporary. And we need this sustaining encouragement that helps us through this weary, strange land of brokenness and sin and sorrow. In the Old Testament Psalms, David writes, Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth. What's he going to say? It's over, it's over, I'm coming again. And he says, gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. It's not always easy to live for God. You've got to sacrifice of this world. You can't live for this world. It's not always easy, but there's a sacrifice. But Jesus is going to gather his people and welcome them home. And we're going to join him up in the sky when he comes. It's going to be a beautiful day, a beautiful moment. The thoughts of the coming of the Lord, said Baxter, are most sweet and joyful to me. This is the day that all believers should long and hope and wait for as being the accomplishment of all the work of their redemption and all the desires and endeavors of their souls. Hasten, O Lord, this blessed day. Such was the hope of the apostolic church, of the church in the wilderness, and of the Reformation. It's the hope. He's coming again. He's coming. He's coming. And it has to be our hope as well. Our name, Seventh Day, what? Adventists. What does that mean? Adventists. The Advent. He's coming. Seventh day is where we came from. He made us. The seventh day. The Advent. We're looking forward to going home with Him. And this name expresses the hope of our movement and our mission. Waiting, longing, working. It's the heartbeat of our mission to go into all the world, prepare the world. He's coming again. He's coming again. Prepare to meet Jesus. When you open the New Testament, you read about John the Baptist, who was a great prophet, who was called to prepare Israel for the first coming of Jesus. And the Bible says in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and he was telling people, repent and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he says this, the Bible says, this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Prepare to meet Jesus. 
He's the Messiah. Get ready. Get ready. The Messiah is here. Meet him. Get ready. And he called people to repentance to prepare for the coming of Jesus. And so that is our work as Seventh-day Adventists to encourage people to look forward to this coming of Christ. Now, you know, we live in a very broken world, right? There's disasters, there's wars, there's famine, there's poverty. Uh, you can't hear the news without talking about coronavirus. What a broken world. It's painful. The Bible says in Mark 13, 8, says there, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be earthquakes in various places and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. It is a sorrowful world. That's the world we live in. Welcome to planet Earth. And Jesus said, in Matthew, he knew what we'd face. He says, take therefore no thought of the morrow, for the morrow will take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Every day has its evil tragedies. Now the New Living Translation, a newer version says, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today, right? That's enough. You don't have to worry about all the things in the future. Just by God's grace, let's live today and do our best and be a joyful, happy Christian and try to serve and help others the best we can. Coronavirus. Last I heard the news yesterday, I think over 100,000 people have been infected. About 3,400 have died. Um, it's spreading. Eight new cases in B.C. Uh, it's spread over to 80 countries around the world. You know, I think our medical system is trying to do their best. I want to say, if it continues growing and get bigger, I want to say, we have a knowledge to treat it. And please learn how to do hydrotherapy fomentations. No question, it'll conquer it. It's the way our bodies work, the hot and cold, hot and cold, hot and cold, we'll treat it. They used it for the, what was it, the N1, F, N1, H1N1, H1, H1N1 virus. But there's also in Africa this year, grasshoppers are the worst they have been in 25 years. Swarms. There's swarms of these grasshoppers. There's up to 80 million hungry little pests and they travel up to 130 kilometers per day and they destroy food that can suffice the needs of 2,500 people per day. And there's hordes of these grasshoppers and they're expecting a famine on the east side of Africa because grasshoppers just destroying flocks and, uh, you know, the food that people are raising. 1.2 billion People in the world live in extreme poverty. Less than one dollar per day. Poverty creates ill health because it forces people to live in environments that make them sick without decent shelter, clean water, or adequate sanitation. What a broken world. Have you ever walked through a children's hospital? Whew. That's just not a pretty picture. Children suffering from things they don't deserve to suffer from. It takes your breath away. What a broken world, sad world. 
Have we forgotten the war in Syria? That it seemed that the world just watched. 400,000 died, up to some 585. They don't really know how many civilians. It was just a massacre, slaughter, and bombing, and killing. Just death every day, still going on. What a world, a broken world. Refugees around the world. 25.9 million refugees globally. The highest level ever recorded. I mean, you think about 25.9 million. Canada has, what, 35, 36 million people? I mean, this is two-thirds the population of Canada are refugees. Half of the world's refugees are children. And a third of refugees, 6.7 million people, are hosted by the world's poorest countries. Hardly have enough money to take care of themselves. And they travel by foot, by boat, and that's not a bus. But they travel trying to escape their homelands, which is not always a pretty place to live. Welcome to reality. What do we need? Not wishful thinking isn't going to just solve the problem. Not holding a positive thought, but a confident knowledge of what's real. A rock-solid expectation that we can build our lives on. Something real, something trustworthy, and that is what God's Word <laughs> has given us faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is being sure of what we hope for. It is being certain of what we do not see. We have that assurance that God is coming again. At hope, that blessed hope. Psalms 135, I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. His word is our guide. His word is our foundation. His word is our strength. His word will guide us through the mess of this world. What's the hope? You know what the last few verses of the Bible are? In Revelation 22:20, 20, the last words of Jesus, surely, I am coming quickly. He's coming. He says, I'm going to come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, writes the Apostle John. Come, come, Lord Jesus. And then the very last verse, this is the second last verse, but then John writes, he says, Jesus is coming again. Come, Lord Jesus. And then he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. John knew that in this broken world, we're going to need a lot of grace, a lot of strength, a lot of grace to make it through the sorrow, the pain, suffering, the hurt, the anguish. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Corinthians 13, 13 says there's three things will last forever. These are the three great forces of life that we can hold on to. Faith, hope, and love. These are those, this is the strength of our, our, our confidence in God. Faith, faith in God. Hope for the future and love for one another. Love for God and love to help this broken world the best we can. These are the great driving motivations of life. Faith in God. Faith. God is with us. Faith that God will bring us through. And hope. Hope in that second coming. The coming of the Lord has been in all ages the hope of His true followers. The Savior's parting promise upon all of it that He would come again 
lighted up the future for his disciples, filling their hearts with joy and hope that sorrow could not quench nor trials dim. Amid sufferings and persecution, the appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ was the blessed hope. And the early church used to encourage one another with the words, Maranatha, Maranatha, the Lord is coming, Maranatha. And when they would part, they'd say to one another, Maranatha. And John, or Paul writes those famous words, describing this event that has cheered so many people. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with a voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. This is going to be a big event. This is an earth-shaking event. It's going to be a beautiful, glorious, climactic wonderful happening. Then we who are alive and remain, if we're alive, we're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Those who have died and are raised back to life will all be gathered up in the sky with Jesus to meet him. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. That's a beautiful hope, isn't it? I like the way the Message Bible translates it. Eugene Peterson writes, Then there will be one huge family reunion with the Master. Isn't that good? One big family reunion together with the Lord forever. And then Paul finishes that chapter by saying, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort. Comfort. Encourage one another. Another translation says, so cheer each other up with these words of comfort. Cheer each other. Jesus is coming. He's going to raise our lost loved ones. I did. Alan prayed in his prayer. I just came from the hospital this morning to be with the family who <sighs> saying goodbye to their father and grandfather, I read this verse as the family was there in the room together, and it is the blessed hope that when we lose a loved one, and when they have to pull the tubes and the life support off, how do you cheer each other up? How do you, what's the joy? Well, this is, not all finished yet. There's still a final chapter. So cheer each other up. The Amplified Bible says, therefore comfort and encourage one another with these words. The Greek word here, this is interesting. I was talking to our son last night. He's taking Greek over in Berman University and he mentioned it's parakleo. The same word that we get the word parakletos for the Holy Spirit. Parakle, 